Hello everyone, Harry Bulldock here, editor at Total Telecom. The global semiconductor supply crisis has been raging for many months now, and it's having a huge effect on numerous industries from telecoms to automotive. But beyond just economic implications, there's also a geopolitical dimension with markets in both the East and the West reacting very differently to the chip shortage. Uh, it's my pleasure to be joined by Caroline Gabriel, Research Director at Analysis Mason, who's here with me today to discuss the crisis and especially the way the Chinese market is reacting to it. Uh, Caroline, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, first things first, uh, let's start quite broad. What's your overall impression of the global chip shortage so far? And do you see China playing a key role in helping to alleviate it in future? Yes, I think um, the global chip shortage is, is clearly a major crisis. I think initially it was seen mainly through the prism of COVID um, and the disruptions, and there was a hope that those could be addressed fairly quickly. I think it's very clear that there, as you said in your introduction, there are other dimensions to it. and. The, uh, the COVID is sort of coinciding with some of those geopolitical um, trends that have, that have gone on, um, which are certainly not um, being particularly helpful um, at addressing the shortage. Um, I think we've seen a tendency for the major technical um, powers to uh, sort of retreat behind their walls to try to build up their own uh, their own um, chip um, power, if you like, rather than cooperating broadly. Um, I think this is potentially quite disastrous um, from the point of view of the shortage being prolonged for um, for longer than it needs to be. And as you say, that has an impact on telecoms and automotive on many very important industries. Um, I think there is the potential um, for uh, China to play quite a big role in alleviating the shortage through cooperation. I mean, there's been talk about um, Chinese companies cooperating with European companies, for instance. Um, together they can uh, combine skills, um, put together complementary areas of expertise, achieve greater scale. And I think any global crisis, whether it's te technical or anything else, um, is best addressed cooperatively um, and with everybody pooling their resources. I think we have you know, limited expectation that, um, that that's going to come from the United States in the current climate. Um, but I do think there's a lot more appetite in Europe, in other parts of Asia um, to work with China. Um, China obviously has massive scale and massive technological capability. Uh, and that could certainly um, help to uh, alleviate the shortage through innovation. But I think most importantly in the short term, um, by just building up um, global scale and the flexibility to get chips moving to where they're needed rather than having them uh, sort of stuck in, in, in certain um, regional silos. That, that really brings me on quite nicely to my next question, which is about the significance of the uh, recent developments regarding China's new competencies in uh, 14 nanometers and 20, 28 nanometer chips. Uh, how close would you say to China is, is uh, in terms of becoming self-sufficient when it comes to semiconductor production? Well, I, I think a lot closer than um, probably we'd have predicted a couple of years ago. Um, you know, the the sort of national um, dedication to achieving that self-sufficiency has been very strong um, and the levels of innovation um, have, have been impressive. So uh, it, it looks um, extremely likely um, that they would get to self-sufficiency um, in production on uh, 28 nanometer this year and 14 nanometer um, next year. Um, and those, uh, of course, there's a lot of conversation about the smaller geometries, but we have to remember that, they, that 14 and 28 are among the kind of workhorse chips. Um, the largest percentage of chips globally um, now are using uh, those processes. So it's extremely important to get to self-sufficiency in that. And then relating back to um, talking about the chip shortage, you know, perhaps not just to be sufficient for the Chinese market, um, but to be able to start supplying and exporting to, um, to other markets as well. Looking forward then, what do you think lies ahead for the Chinese semiconductor industry? And what competencies do they really need to develop if they're going to reach that goal of self-sufficiency? Well, I suppose the, the big challenge um, remains getting the foundries in China to the really cutting edge processes, to being able to get to seven nanometers and below. You know, we know that um, TSMC is getting to, you know, two and three. 
um, we're getting them down to extremely small geometries. And although those will account only for a small percentage of chips in numbers terms in, uh, the, you know, in the short term, um, those are going into very important applications like um, advanced smartphones, um, things that are, are extremely important to the global industry. So, um, so I, I do think that, um, that that's the key challenge um, for China. They've shown how quickly they can innovate um, on the, those slightly bigger geometries. And, uh, and the foundries undoubtedly um, are becoming you know, far more advanced. Um, they've had big challenges of not being able to access some um, American technology. But it seems if, if the 14 nanometer is anything to go by, that seems to have been less disastrous than it first appeared. Um, and there's been a lot of effort to either develop homegrown technology or to turn to partners who who are still you know happy to uh, to work with uh, the Chinese foundries. So uh, I don't think this is in, an insurmountable obstacle, but it's certainly um, true that until China can get to those uh, those cutting edge processes, there will be areas of the uh, important areas of the high tech markets where they won't be able to participate and where they'll be needing to get chips from elsewhere. So. Um, uh, so that has to be the, the number one, um, you know, competency that that needs to be acquired. And more generally, I think it's about just building up um, a more robust ecosystem within the country, um, not just having one or two companies um, that that can supply the essential enablers of chip making, but building a broader ecosystem and starting to uh, develop chips in um, some some other areas. I mean, China's been very advanced in developing um, certain types of AI chips, for instance. That's an expertise that could be shared with others around the world, you know, perhaps in return for uh, expertise in some types of chips where there's, uh, there is less advanced um, competency, some, some areas of IoT, for instance. We focused on China so far. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the European market, because this is an area where we've seen some quite significant announcements over the last month or so. Um, how would you describe the current plans and progress of the European semiconductor industry? And what do you think that's going to mean for uh, the wider ecosystem? Yes, I mean, Europe's really interesting. It, it shares some challenges with China. I mean, not on the geopolitical side, but um, in the sense that it has very big chip makers, but they are, um, they are not at the cutting edge in general. And so, you know, we have very established companies like ST Micro, um, who, are, who are huge and very important in some um, areas of chip making, but have not invested into the really cutting edge processes uh, and therefore can't participate in perhaps the most advanced 5G applications, for instance. So uh, I, I think, you know, Europe shares um, some challenges uh, with China in, in that respect. But as you say, there's been um, a, a lot of activity in Europe, the European Union um, and some of the individual governments within that, like China, have set very aggressive targets to try to be self-sufficient and also to build an export industry as well. Um, I think there's, you know, there's a real sense amid all the geopolitical tensions that we're looking at um, and, and the disruption to supply chains that Europe needs to be um, more self-sufficient, have more of a robust ecosystem. Uh, and uh, to, to sort of move on from the rather old school um, industry that it has at the minute. So yes, we're seeing uh, a lot of incentives being offered to companies to, to come in and build those plants and bring that expertise with them. And um, Intel TSMC in particular um, are, are both said to be making or planning very big investments with big incentives from the European Union to do that. Um, so that will be very, important um, but of course it's going to take time I mean these advanced foundries take some years to set up and, and get moving so in the meantime I think Europe again rather like China has to look at perhaps how it can leverage the assets it does have uh, more effectively and particularly I think looking at chips that are being made um, for other industries so this isn't just about telecoms um, particularly automotive where the uh, big European chip makers have significant strengths um, and in, in some areas are cutting edge. It, increasingly, as you'll know, there are, you know, there are technologies and processes that um, cross over between the different sectors. And, um, and I think perhaps uh, Europe, um, the, the chip industry collectively needs to do more to, uh, to foster collaborations and exchanges of knowledge between 
um, different sectors and particularly between automotive chip makers and telecom chip makers. Caroline, thank you so much for your insight. It's been really great speaking to you today.